In today's video, we have all the latest trade talks surrounding players like Claude Giroux, Patrick Lani, and yes, Mark andre Fleury as well. Plus, we have a suspension, we have news from the NHL waiver wire, an update on the NHL schedule, and some injuries and fines. All that and more coming up next. Well, welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. As I mentioned, we have a variety of NHL news and rumors to discuss today. Uh, first up, we finally got word from the NHL today on the updated NHL schedule. So we now know what they plan to do with what was originally the Olympic and NHL All-Star break. There was a gap of a couple of weeks there, of course, where NHL players were uh, not going to be playing hockey because of other activities like the Olympics. And of course, now we know that's not happening. So with all the games postponed, uh, they've uh, filled out the schedule. A lot of teams are going to be very, very busy uh, with the games I think are starting up the Monday after the All-Star game. Uh, there's really not going to be much of a break at all. Uh, some teams are going to be playing around like 50 games in like 100 days. So it's pretty uh, jam-packed but they were able to put the games in without extending the season any further. They're still within the original calendar. Of course if they do run into any other issues with games being postponed, uh, it's probably going to be very, very challenging to not extend it by at least a few days or something something to that effect but at this point they're able to get all those games in so we'll see um you know we shouldn't have other issues either because of the updated protocols that they announced uh just in the last day or so with the all-star game um going to be like that, that point where things change after the all-star break like i mentioned we have no more testing if they're asymptomatic uh, and they're only going to be tested if they are uh, needing to cross the border between Canada, United States, or of course, if they do have symptoms. But as I mentioned as well, testing would have been drastically down anyway, because many players have tested positive, including 73% of the NHL rosters this season. And once they have a positive test, they don't have to take any more tests for a 90 day period and a big chunk of that 73 percent has happened in the last five to six weeks so we're probably looking at a couple more months obviously or more before they'd have to start testing again anyway so they should be able to get through these games without running into uh you know any other issues and uh, hopefully not have any delays and get through the uh, current calendar of the nhl season and then go into the playoffs and Hopefully, I guess the, the places that do have restrictions on fans, which is mostly, I believe, only in Canada, um, Alberta has limited capacity and everybody else is down to uh, to no fans. Well, hopefully they can get those fans back here soon. I know there's uh, many provinces have plans to start reopening and loosening restrictions around uh, uh, January 31st, February 1st time frame for most things. So hopefully before the end of the season, they can get their fans back and start generating more revenue here yet again. Uh, of course, on to the NHL waiver wire. We had some news and activity today with there being a claim and additional players being placed. The Detroit Red Wings have claimed forward Jamel Smith, who was on waivers yesterday from the Tampa Bay Lightning. Of course, uh, Jamel Smith was on season opening injured reserve, which is why he required waivers because he would have had to gone through that at the beginning of the season to be assigned. Uh, and that, of course, wasn't eligible since he was hurt. Now that he's able to come back and play, he goes through waivers and he gets picked up by the Red Wings. I'm sure for Jamel Smith, he probably has mixed emotions. Nobody really likes to change teams midseason. I'm sure it's tough. But at the same time, his brother, Giovanni Smith, plays for Detroit. So that will make things easier uh, in a sense. At least you get a brother reunion uh, with the Red Wings there. So we'll see. Uh, hopefully he can find himself a spot and uh, kind of stick things out so the, the brothers can play together because I'm sure they would really love that. Uh, Oilers defenseman William Lagerson was on waivers yesterday and he cleared so he can be assigned to the taxi squad or to Bakersfield. Uh, waivers today, there's two additional players on waivers. The New Jersey Devils have defenseman Colton White on waivers and the Ottawa Senators have defenseman Dylan Hetherington on waivers. Uh, the Hetherington actually, in his case, He's done relatively well in his limited time in Ottawa, but since um, they've given more opportunity to a couple of other young defensemen like J uh, Jacob Bernard Docker and Eric Branstrom, uh, largely due to the fact that the, between COVID and injuries, the Sens have been absolutely you know hit hard this year, uh, and they had some injuries, but like Josh Brown was out for a long time, Zaitsev was out for a long time, and these guys have come in and they've played well, and it's I think no fault of his own. It's just those young guys of uh, who you know project to be a bigger part of the franchise moving 
moving forward. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, a little higher end talent on the depth chart. It just kind of pushed them down. Uh, so we'll see where these players go. They could be assigned to their minor league affiliate or taxi squads if they uh, are ended up clearing. But, of course, the other thing with the, uh, the protocols changing after the All-Star break is the taxi squads also are going away at that point as well. It's not likely going to be extended, given all the other changes we've seen. So some of these players that are getting a chance to hang around NHL teams more and be available will end up going back down to the minors. Now, we've also seen some fines and a suspension based on action that took place last night. Uh, LA Kings of Center Ice Ben Philip Deneau has been fined for $5,000, which I know doesn't seem like much, but it is the most eligible by the CBA at this time for a dangerous trip against Braden Point of the Tampa Bay Lightning. So he was fined for that incident. And, of course, uh, current Montreal Canadian forward Jonathan Durant. Of course, as this seems funny, talking about Deneau in L.A., and we're talking about Durant, of course, former teammates here. But he was fined 5000 as well for a cross-check. The Hams played the Dallas Stars last night, and he was involved in a situation with Tyler Sagan. So uh, a couple of 5K fines. And then we also had a kneeing incident between uh, the defenseman Dmitry Orlov of the Capitals uh, on uh, Nick Ehlers of the Jets, and Orlov has been suspended two games for that. Uh, it did appear to be, in my opinion, a little bit of a reckless hit that could have been avoided, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, an unfortunate situation there for Ehlers. So Orlov will sit for two games. Now, Kevin Hayes is also going to be out again. Uh, Philly has really had a mess this season. Uh, not only have they not played well, but, you know, to make matters worse and, and more challenging for them, they've certainly had their fair share of injuries, including Hayes and defenseman Ryan Ellis, who's missed significant time. Uh, of course, Hayes has been out for multiple reasons. Uh, and the latest stint is a three- to four-week uh, absence, and he's going to require surgery on an ad doctor. So, uh, again, Hayes is not having an ideal year. Uh, obviously, he dealt with the loss of his brother earlier, plus he had off-season surgery. So, he's had a lot going on. It's been a real tough year on on Big Kevin Hayes. So, we'll see what this means for the Flyers. They're certainly going to be one of the teams we're going to be uh, talking a bit about here today in the future of uh, one of their longtime players and longtime captains, Claude Drew, which we'll get to here momentarily. But before we jump into the trade rumor part of the video today, I do need to pause for a moment and acknowledge our channel sponsor, Manscaped. Name a better duo than McDavid and Dreisaitl this season. I've got one, Manscaped and Grooming. That's right, our sponsors at Manscaped, the global leaders in below-the-waist grooming, have all the best tools to clean up your whole act when it comes to your hygiene for men. It's time to skate on the first line with the global leaders here in men's hygiene and join the movement at Manscaped where you can get the Performance Package 4.0, which includes the Lawnmower 4.0, as well as some fantastic new products just recently launched, including the brand new 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner. This is a terrific product. It allows you to wash your hair in one fell swoop, leaves you smelling great. It has the refined cologne quality fragrance attached. Absolutely phenomenal. And, of course, the other new product most recently launched is the Premium Body Wash to kind of complete the set. But that's not all. Manscaped has new products coming out here yet again in January, so you want to stay tuned. The Body Wash gives you deep hydration, keeps you smelling great, and not only smelling great, but feeling moisturized as well. Join the movement at manscaped.com and use promo code TSH for 20% off and free shipping. That's promo code TSH for 20% off and free shipping. So thanks very much for watching that promotional content. I do greatly appreciate it. As I mentioned, we get some brand new products here from Manscaped in the last couple of days. They've launched uh, a new body spray as well as a deodorant. They've recently launched a shampoo conditioner as well as a body wash. So they really have all your needs covered for male grooming. Excellent products. I highly recommend them. And certainly take advantage of our promo code to get 20% off and free shipping as mentioned in the ad piece. Now, on to the trade rumor section of the video. And I have uh, three players we really want to talk about today, but it's actually going to kind of spawn into four based on what activity we might see happen. Now, first up, I want to talk about Patrick Lani of the Blue Jackets. Uh, some information from Elliot Friedman in his latest 32 Thoughts blog. makes us think hard about the future of Lani in Columbus or whether or not uh, he will end up staying. Essentially, uh, he wonders where Lani is a pending restricted free agent if it's the best use of resources by the Blue Jackets to lock him up long term. Clearly, he hasn't been the old Lani that we saw in his early days with Winnipeg since he arrived in Columbus. Of course, his first uh, part of the year, which was last year after the trade for Dubois, um, 
uh, Deals head coach John Tortorella. That really didn't go well. Didn't bring up the best in him. And this year, as much as he had a real good start to the year, he's been uh, I mean, he's been back now, but he missed a, a bunch of time due to combination of injury uh, in a personal leave due to the death in the family. So certainly not going well. His numbers aren't terrible, but they're not awesome either. Um, so we'll see where this goes. I mean, Columbus, I don't really think has had a real fair chance to see the true uh, line at his absolute best like we saw in Winnipeg when he was scoring 40 goals a season. So I think between now and the trade deadline, they have some hard questions to ask themselves, but this might not be a deal that we see by the deadline. The Jackets are not in a situation where they're really forced to make a decision. He's not a UFA, so he's not like he can walk for nothing in the summer. He's an RFA. They hold his rights, so there's no big rush here, but they do need to take their time and decide if he's a big part of the future. Do they sign him long-term or not? Because he's one year away from being an unrestricted free agent. If he goes into the summer and takes another one-year deal, which is certainly not something he would be opposed to based on his past history here recently this year, taking his qualifying offer for a one-year contract like Friedman said he's he could see him doing it again if he's not real sure and I can understand why Lime might be hesitant to commit long term to Columbus given the fact that they're not a real strong team right now he might want to see more for their future plans and decide if he wants to be a part of that or if he might want to move on and the Jackets have the same thing to see from him do, do they get the 30-40 goal guy or is his, his you know is his game changing will he be able to find that again it's it's hard to say and it's uh you know you're kind of dating right now and you're deciding if you want to get married or do you want to go here separate ways is kind of what what's happening here so Lani could be a player that signs a long-term deal he could be traded by the deadline he could be traded in the offseason there's real no links to other teams right now that are inquiring on his availability but you have to think as we get closer to the deadline especially if he's not signed teams will call and inquire um, and it's just a player that situation that we want to watch it's really nothing imminent there but based on Friedman's uh, comments in his blog it certainly makes a lot of sense that um, you know it's a questionable situation and something we have to see I don't really don't know where it would be a great fit for Patrick Lani but to me he has to play with higher end players uh, like he did originally Winnipeg I mean he had some real good fits there in his early days always wanted more and have a chance to play on the top line with guys like Shifley and Wheeler uh, they were reluctant to put him there uh, obviously Kyle Connor was a great fit there too um, got a chance to play a fair bit with his buddy Nick Ehlers that worked out well but you know what like it's just hard to say where his long-term future really holds uh, he's he gonna want that long-term deal only time will tell but certainly a player worth watching here more likely I think that with the off seasons the more of the time we're probably gonna see a trade and I could see something like that that would be like your ideal kind of like NHL draft day kind of trade at the floor maybe somebody offers up a first round pick and uh, you know prospects or something to that effect a package of futures that Columbus might be real happy on uh, making the swap so we'll see where that goes now will longtime flyers captain and uh, you know really one of their best players in the franchise's recent history Claude Giroux find himself on the move it sounds like more and more likely that the flyers are going to give him the opportunity to go chase this Stanley cup elsewhere now of course they're not really going to be anywhere near the playoffs it doesn't look like they said as i mentioned on the kevin hayes information their season's been a pretty much another disaster that's back-to-back seasons that now that are not good we're probably going to see the, uh, some significant change in philly i think it's fair to say i do think it's fair to question the job future of chuck fletcher as general manager um or, or at the very least if, if they continue with him uh, there's going to be big changes you have to think after the year that they've had however will drew want to be a part of the future that's a difficult question and whether or not he re-signs after the season, even if he is traded, is a possibility. I know Elliot Friedman made mention the fact that he could see Giroux being traded and then re-signed with the Flyers, and I wouldn't rule that out either, but I think a lot of that is going to depend on the future of the franchise. Now, where could Giroux end up? We've heard uh, rumors from a couple different sources, including Friedman and Merrick, and of course the Cold Stove Podcast, which was just released today, with some great information as well and some great insight. And the teams being mentioned right now as being potential uh, candidates to land Claude Giroux are the Avalanche, for one, uh, for the Rangers, uh, the Canes, uh, and the Bruins. Um, I could see a team like the Islanders being interested if they were in the mix, but they're not right now. If they, I mean, it's going to be real hard to get them in the mix too. Now, if he doesn't uh, end up going back to Philly, I could see maybe in the offseason as a free agent. But in all honesty, the Avalanche make a ton of sense. I can see them uh, making a, a move or two, depending on what they can squeeze in with their cap 
to really uh, make an a, a opportunity to go for it. I think they can see an opportunity in the Western Conference that they have a, you know probably have an easier time getting through to the Stanley Cup Final this year and adding a top six forward, maybe even some goaltending insurance would likely be the area that they look at. I could even see them adding a goal uh, defense as well, to be honest. I think it's really going to boil down to what they can squeeze in uh, with the cap. Now, what would the Avalanche and the Flyers have discussed for a package? Now, according to the Cold Stove podcast, they had information to suggest that they have had some limited conversations and that the original ask by Philly was young top forward Alex Newhook, which the Avalanche quickly rejected. And, uh, you know, the discussions really never really went any further. Um, now, maybe a guy like Tyson Jost or, you know, maybe a, a Martin Kaut or a lower level prospect uh, could be something that's maybe included or maybe a second round pick. There could be a combination of a player and pick there, uh, something to that effect. That would probably be something the Avalanche would be more comfortable with. But we will see. They're certainly interested and apparently have already at least touched base and had discussions. Uh, now, the Rangers, of course, are, are, you know, division rivals. So they may have to pay a little bit more. Same thing with Carolina to get a deal done. The Rangers have a guy like Vitaly Kravtsov who, you know, wants a, a fresh start somewhere else. He would be a great fit, uh, you know, obviously uh, in Philly. You know, they, they could have another young player to add to their mix. Could that be a situation where maybe it's a Kravtsov and a draft pick for, for Giroux? I could see that being a possibility. With the Boston Bruins, I don't know what it would take on their end. They might have to give up a guy like Jack Stanika, which may not be the most you know, appealing to them, but they've been reluctant to, to give them more of a chance to. So I'm not really sure how the Bruins are feeling about, well, at one point that I consider really one of their top stars or prospect stars. Uh, it could also be a guy like Johnny Beecher, a decent prospect for them. Uh, hard to say exactly. I don't see them moving a guy like Oscar Steen. He's been very, uh, obviously very, uh, you know, a pleasant surprise. Of course, there's always Jake DeBrus too. Now, DeBrus is young enough. Would the Flyers have interest there? You have to think, since he's asked for a trade, could we see a DeBrus for Giroux? deal. Uh, I would have to think that's at least a possibility of uh, something that we're going to end up seeing discussed. When it comes to the Canes, uh, hard to say exactly. Uh, it's believed that maybe a guy like Jack Drury would have interest to the Flyers, but it's believed the Canes are pretty high on him that they may not want to go there. But as we've heard from Friedman, Merrick, and others, expect teams like Carolina and even to a degree like uh, Colorado and Florida to be in almost every player mentioned because they're going to be looking to do something, all do something significant here ahead of the playoffs because they see an opportunity to be real solid cup contenders this year. I'm not really sure who else the Kings would be willing to give up, but they do have some other interesting young prospects that could be intriguing to Philly. Maybe a, a young player like a Dominic Bach who's yet to come over to the NHL. Uh, you know, or other prospects that are in the mix there. I mean, Seth Jarvis would be a no-go. I think Drury would be a no-go. But they could have some other uh, young talent there that might be intriguing to Philly. Hard to say what they could get done. Um, but, you know, Giroux, at this point, he has all the control. I would imagine that that's a situation where uh, Philly's going to work with him. And based on what we've heard, too, it sounds like Giroux would obviously prefer to go to a team that's not too far from Philly so he doesn't have to be gone from home for, like, an extended extended time. He'd still be able to, you know, kind of commute or go back and forth a little bit, and it wouldn't be too terribly far from his family or his family could travel a little bit easier to come see him as well. Uh, you know, there was one talk about maybe Giroux to Edmonton or something like that, but that's that's a long ways away. I don't see that being very likely. I would think he's probably going to stay, you know, like I said, New York, Carolina, not too far. Boston's not too far. The Avs, not terribly far. I could see that being the most likely destinations. They all make sense for a variety of reasons, and we'll see. But there is a lot of um, uh, thought here within the NHL insiders world that Giroux will almost definitely be traded, and those are the teams being linked to him right now and we'll see where that goes but could he resign at philly in the offseason it is possible i would not call it a guarantee now when it comes to goaltending and mark andre fleury uh the latest report from mark lazarus of the athletic indicates based on his recent sources they're saying that the hawks are pretty much guaranteed to trade flurry he does have a 10 team modified no trade so certainly he has some control over where his uh, destination ends up uh, and there's also a lot of speculation on whether or not he will continue to play and obviously will he want to move his family like, there's a lot of things that go into this for Marc Andre and it's certainly you know hard to say what his feelings are on the matter but he doesn't have 100% control 
of the situation. Now, uh, based on the sources Lazarus was dealing with, though, they said almost a guarantee that the Hawks trade Flurry and not re-sign him. Given his age, it doesn't make sense. They don't know if he wants to continue playing. And really, based on what's on that roster and the fact that the Hawks are not going to be a playoff team and need to continue uh, rebuilding and resetting here, that he's one of the few guys on the roster that's a pending UFA that would have value to bring back something decent on a trade return. You know, guys like Taze and Kane at this point could get them a good return, but they have full no moves and there's no indication they want to leave or the franchise wants to move them out. Uh, there's been, you know, some different reports on that matter over the time. And we'll see where that goes. But as of right now, there's no indication to say that, you know, anything like that's anywhere near happening. So, yes, they could bring back value. But besides that, you're looking at Flurry being one of your main guys that would do that. I mean, they could try like Alex Debrinkit. He gets you good value, but they have no intention of doing that either, right? So when it comes to Marc-Andre Fleury, um, you have to think a few teams like the Oilers for one, the Capitals and the Avalanche are the teams we're hearing the most. Now, that might be surprising to some. There's no surprise. Edmonton needs a goaltender, and that could be a real possibility. And, of course, we don't know if he could block a trade to the Oilers or if he'd want to do that or not. Uh, the Avalanche, as I mentioned, I can see them attempting multiple deals. Uh, a lot of that's going to depend on cap, of course, and what they can squeeze in here. But certainly uh, it's fair to say that Darcy Kemper hasn't been quite the goalie that they hope, and they could bring in some reinforcements, and that wouldn't be a terrible idea. So I wouldn't rule that possibility out. Now the part about the Capitals might seem odd to many, thinking why would Washington go out and get a goalie? But uh, according to uh, El Tariq Al-Bashir, who covers the Capitals for the Athletic, the Capitals aren't apparently super thrilled with their tandem of Samsonov and Venacek. And even though the stats don't look terrible, they look decent, and the Capitals have had a, a solid season and are bound for the playoffs here yet again, uh, they're, they're not completely sold on that tandem being it for the playoffs. And a Vitek Venacek trade is not out of the question. I think they still see Samsonov being the long-term fit as the starter. So they obviously don't want to part with him. But Venacek's contract is cheap and he's been real good uh, in my opinion. But obviously maybe not quite good enough for the Capitals to be confident in a playoff run. And obviously moving him to a team like the Oilers would free up some possibility there and then of course to have the Hawks trade Flurry to the Capitals that could be a scenario that we see where the Oilers get their goalie and the Capitals get themselves a goalie upgrade now that would be weird for Flurry after all those battles being a penguin going against the Capitals but we've seen crazier weirder things of course um, and he could very well end up back in the Metro Division and maybe even end up doing battle with the Penguins in the playoffs, which would be odd, but it very well could be a scenario that we see, uh, given, like I said, with, with what Lazarus is saying, it's a very, very high probability that Fleury is moved. And right now, those are the teams that make sense. And really, Washington, I'm not sure what uh, Fleury would they'd have to get up to get Fleury, but really, would you rather go into the playoffs with Samsonov and Venacek or Samsonov and Fleury? I mean, Fleury could be that they, they have to kind of consider going for it with the, when they have your top players like Ovi and Backstrom and you know, they're getting up there. I don't, I know they're not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. They have longer term contracts, but still this is a year that they could be like, have like a, like a Renaissance team and kind of go forward here yet again and possibly get a second Stanley cup. You have to take that chance. Uh, and you know, it might be worth sacrificing Venacek for to get that second Stanley Cup if that's how they're looking at it. And they might be able to get a decent return out of Edmonton in order to take for, for, for Venacek to go there. And a lot of the Oilers' issues will depend on Mike Smith's health and, of course, Koskinen. Can they move Koskinen? The Capitals probably wouldn't take Koskinen with another team. Hard to say. There's a lot of moving parts there, but there could be a goalie carousel kind of, you know, go around here where many teams kind of get what they need and uh, satisfy some different needs uh, all in one here. So Flurry could be the big one to move to kind of make everything else kind of happen and help other teams, even if he's not the one going directly to them. So we'll see. But the Avalanche are a team to watch in all this too. Of course, I didn't link the Avs to a goaltender. And right now, it's not quite clear what their plans are, but it is possible that if a team like the Capitals don't end up with Flurry, wouldn't be shocking to see the Avs in on that as well. Either way, I see him going to a contender and battling for another Stanley Cup. So let me know your thoughts on something discussed here today down in the comments. We'll discuss further. If you're new to this channel, make sure you subscribe and stick around. We'll keep you up to date with all the latest news, rumors, and analysis on all 32 NHL teams. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you next time.